You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. In this episode, host Liz Carlisle and guests from Mali, Addis Ababa and the UK discuss the current opportunity for governments to address the crises of debt, climate and biodiversity destruction through a new use of the system for debt swaps for climate and nature. Hello and welcome to Make Change Happen, number eight. It's great to have you with us all as listeners and many thanks to you for uh, staying with us and giving us positive feedback. I'm your host today, Liz Carlisle, and I'm Director of Communications at IIED. We have a great episode for you today, I think. We'll be talking about debt swaps for climate and nature. A pretty controversial issue, but an idea that could really offer great gains for the well-being of our planet and to help relieve the urgent pressure on developing country debt. So I think we'll cover kind of what they are, how they might work, and, and what are some of the sort of opportunities and challenges. And with me today to talk about that are three people here. We have Yakuba Dem from Mali, and Yakuba is the country director from the Near East Foundation. And he has over 30 years experience in rural development and natural resource management as well as capacity building and training. So a very established person in thinking about how particular operationizing field level approaches and mainstreaming uh, can get into development planning at the local level. Welcome, Yakuba. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Hi. We are also joined by Jean-Paul Adam, who is the Director for Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resource Management in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And Jean-Paul has uh, lots of government experience. Um, He calls himself a, a career diplomat, if you like, and has held ministerial posts in the government of the Republic of the Seychelles, Minister for Health, Minister of Finance and Trade and the Blue Economy, and has, importantly for this conversation, practical experience of debt swaps for nature and negotiating how they can come to life. And last but definitely not least, uh, my colleague, Laura Kelly, um, who leads the Sustainable Markets Group in the IIED. And Laura has many years of senior level um, experience in policy engagement, dealing with topics around trade and development in the private sector. So welcome to you, John Paul and Laura. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Yes, good to be here, Liz. Great. And Laura, I'm going to start with you, I think. You know, we're always looking for silver bullets. We're looking for answers. So is this one, is debt swaps for nature one of the answers? You know, how do they work? Can we tell our listeners what they are and, and how they might work? Well, hopefully they're part of an answer, Liz. I don't think they are a silver bullet because they're potentially quite <laughs> complex. But let me have a go at explaining in clear, simple language what we're actually talking about. So the idea of swapping debt for nature and climate is where a lender, be it a a donor government or a, a private bank or an investor, agrees to reduce the repayment of a loan that they've made, in this case, to to a developing country. And there are a number of ways that that can be done. Um, The money, the debt can be converted into the local currency, which can then be used locally rather than having to buy foreign currency to repay the the loan. Uh, Or the um, creditor can agree to a lower interest rate. So more money can be spent locally. Uh, Or if they're really generous, then the creditor can agree to write off the debt completely. What we're then suggesting is that those resources are used by developing country governments who who, um, are the debtors to invest in things that will help address climate change, that will help conserve nature. And they do it in ways that also creates 
jobs, um, particularly now as we're in sort of post-COVID, we're in COVID times, but as we look to post-COVID economic recovery, we're really going to need to get people you know, into sort of sustainable and resilient jobs. So that's the basic principle. The IMF or the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have been meeting just now, haven't they, to be thinking about, you know, the kind of post-COVID-19 recovery on the global economy. And and I think just to remind our listeners, you know, the, the developing country debt at the moment, that the burden that countries are carrying are up to uh, 8 trillion US dollars. So that there is an imperative now, isn't there, to be looking at this? Yeah, it, it really is a, a sort of a very timely intervention. And, you know, it, it, it's getting increasingly urgent. Um, the bank and the fund have also estimated, along with the United Nations, that COVID could put up to half a billion people back below the poverty line. I mean, that's wiping out sort of the last 10 years of development for, for many people. So it really is quite serious. I think the other thing that's quite different about um, what we're suggesting is that the money that is forgiven, if you like, the, um, the, the, the debt that is swapped, that that's actually used by governments through their budgets. So um, there have been initiatives in the past more at a sort of a project level, but we're talking about something that sort of happens at scale. So the money would be used by the governments to set up sort of large scale sort of strategic projects. So that allows it to be more cost effective and to actually sort of get more resources into these kinds of projects. So that is a significant difference from the normal approach in delivery of aid, which is through projects. So those which are tend to be smaller, shorter term, short lived. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And it also puts the, the control into the hands of local government and ho- hopefully local communities. And I think we'll hear more about that from um, from Jean-Paul and Jakuba because, you know, that they've been involved in this kind of programmatic approach um, in climate and nature uh, at the local and national levels. Great. Thanks, Laura. So, Jean-Paul, I think you've had direct experience of some of this. Would you, would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Liz. And, and I, I think this subject could not be more timely, as Laura has already pointed out, because generally countries around the world are facing a, a huge challenge to, to rebuild um, back better after COVID-19, and they don't have the resources. Now, Seychelles, the country where I was uh, previously working as a government minister, and I, was, I had the portfolio for finance um, at the point that uh, Seychelles did its debt swap in 2015. Uh, and Seychelles' context at that time was that we had accumulated uh, quite a large amount of debt over a period of, of time. We had a debt to GDP ratio of 175%. At that time, that was the highest in the world. That, that figure, unfortunately, now is quite common. There are a number of African countries with debt to GDP ratios of above, above 100%. Um, everyone heard the situation that Greece went through. There are a number of countries that are facing these huge debt challenges. But when we faced it, um, it was... There were many reasons uh, why we ended up in that. Some of it were, of course, some, some mistakes that were made, but it went back to the point where uh, Seychelles could no longer borrow on concessional terms because of its uh, GDP per capita rising to a level above that where it could borrow, uh, borrow cheaply and it had to go on the commercial market. And then when you had the financial crisis in 2008, uh, that meant that Seychelles could actually not cater for its debt repayments. And we had a first phase of debt restructuring which was around 2010, negotiated with the Paris Club of Creditors, where Seychelles got a 45% haircut. Uh, but then after that, we, we were looking for ways as well, which we could not only uh, look for some, some way of reducing our debt portfolio, but how we could repurpose that debt into uh, climate resilience. Uh, and that's where the conversation uh, started with the Nature Conservancy, which is a, a US-based NGO, but which operates globally. Uh, to help us in buying back another portion of our debt. That proved quite complicated because Seychelles had already had a first debt swap, um, a first uh, debt restructuring in 2010. Uh, But nonetheless, we managed to do a relatively small amount um, with a further 5% uh, discount. And that debt was bought back using funds that were loaned by the Nature Conservancy and also by uh, philanthropists that assisted us, so up to $5 million. And through that through those two uh, funding mechanisms, Seychelles essentially bought back its debt earlier. And then the debt was restructured into a trust fund established in Seychelles. 
And the formula was then that the Seychelles government continues to repay the debt, but rather than paying it to external creditors, it's paying it locally into a local fund at a much more attractive interest rate. Um, we went from an average interest rate of about 9% to 3%. And those funds that uh, are generated also then go into uh, marine conservation. And in Seychelles, they were linked to the creation of marine protected areas covering 400,000 square kilometers. So it was a, a very interesting and successful uh, operation. This must have been pretty innovative for, for the time. Yes, the, absolutely. As, as far as I'm aware, it's the only marine-based debt swap that has been done to date. Uh, there are debt swaps that have been done, for example, in South America around uh, protecting uh, forested areas and so on. Uh, but the Seychelles one is the first one uh, around a marine protected area. And the, uh, I think what was very interesting as well was that it, it is really engaged with uh, community led organizations because the funds that are going to the trust fund uh, are then dispersed in the form of projects to support uh, community led projects that enhance the biodiversity value, or in, in some cases, build climate resilience. So among the projects, for example, that have been successfully implemented since then, uh, include a voluntary closure of a fishery by the Prana Fishermen Association. This is a, a, the Prana, Prana is the second largest island, and fishermen there agreed to a voluntary closure as part of managing the fish, fish stocks there. There's also a successful project around the monitoring of uh, sooty terns, which are very important in the ecosystem uh, in terms of the food chain uh, relating to fish and relating to uh, the ecosystem around the coastal areas and around coral islands. There, there's also significant support, uh, for example, for mangroves, uh, looking at uh, how we can reduce uh, erosion in the in the areas that were affected. So there's there's been real impact on the ground, as well as the wider goal of having enhanced marine protected areas in line with the goal of the Convention on, Bio, uh, Convention on Biodiversity to achieve up to 30% of marine protected areas. So I think a really nice example there of what you said to the, the engagement at the local level. And we will hear from Yakuba a bit later in the program of the sort of some of the key conditions for getting that right. But if we go back to the global level and this sense of a contributing to a global public good, I guess, this was this was a very innovative program. Laura, what do you think these debt swaps will do for us globally? You know, if we if we take that example of, of a, a sort of first attempt at really thinking this through for some key global environments that we're very, very keen to hang on to, what, what, where do you think this could go? Well, it's really great to hear that example from, from Jean-Paul because, you know, we, we've been so focused in the last sort of year or so on the ocean, the Blue Planet, the David Attenborough program um, and that's you know it's really good to see concrete examples of where resources mm -hmm. are being really channeled to help um, deliver concrete outcomes but we also see the potential um, you know next year is going to be a huge year for the climate and biodiversity we've got uh, the conference of the parties cop 26 um, in the uk in glasgow we've got the biodiversity cop in kunming in china COVID willing, hopefully those those meetings will go ahead as planned. If meetings are coming and going ten to the dozen, but we keep fingers crossed. Exactly, we should have we, we should have been going to Glasgow this year, but we're um hope hopefully going next year. But with these international meetings, what we really want is them to um you know promote you know concrete outcomes, things that actually make a difference for the climate and make a difference for for nature. So you know we see a real potential on the climate side for these swaps to to release more money for uh, investment in uh, climate adaptation, resilience uh, and mitigation, much more than is sort of currently in things like the International Climate Fund or, you know, sort of green funds that, that already exist. You know, there's also the potential, as we've said, for um, sort of COVID recovery. There's also an interesting potential. Um, the, the debt that we're talking about is quite unusual compared to previous um, debt sort of you know John Paul talked about uh, the Seychelles experience this time quite a lot of it is owned by the private sector and you know this this could be people's pension funds and so on and of course you don't want to you know lose that money but if it's getting to the stage where the money can't be repaid then if that um, some of that money is then invested into things like 
uh, climate and, and nature, you know, that that could could have big benefits. And it would you know, also demonstrate that, you know, many of these private investors, banks who talk a lot about inclusivity, sustainability, they talk about the sustainable development goals, they talk about their strategies, they'd actually be you know, delivering concretely on those strategies by having some of these resources invested into these climate and nature swaps. So, Jean-Paul, you know, you've got a very interesting role um, in the in the UN now. You know, what do you see as the potential that these swaps might offer, particularly for countries in Africa? Well, Africa is facing um, a, a huge crisis at the moment. Um, there's, of course, the immediate threat of the COVID-19 pandemic, mm. which uh, uh, has Africa's dealt with it very well in the context of um, being prepared for pandemics and having good contact tracing and, and so on and so forth. But it, it costs health systems a lot. It, it's a, it costs a lot in terms of managing uh, the crisis. There's the economic fallout, which is even more uh, significant. And the climate impact, which um, is was there even before the, uh, the onset of COVID, uh, is estimated to cost uh, African countries between 3 to 5% of GDP uh, based on the current rate of warming. Now, with increased warming, in some cases, our projections show uh, that some African countries in the, in the Sahel will lose up to minus 15% of GDP. So this is massive. It's, it's mm. really a question of double benefit. Can you build climate resilience by investing money in, in key areas that help you fight climate change? And in, in ocean-based economies, it's, it's around, for example, uh, rehabilitating mangrove areas. Um, in, in areas that are affected by desert, desertification, it's about reforestation. Uh, so can you repurpose uh, funds that are already there, in a sense, as, as countries' debt and restructure them a little bit along the lines of what Laura has suggested so that that is actually invested towards uh, boosting climate resilience? And based on the projections of lost GDP, we can already uh, consider boosting African uh, countries' economies by a significant amount every year by doing these kind of activities. Now, and African countries have a, a, a problem at the moment in relation to their ability to mobilize finance. You have some, for example, the least developed countries that do have access to some concessional finance. But the World Bank has, and the IMF have been very direct in saying that the funds that they have will not suffice to meet the global need based on the current uh, situation. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Laura mentioned that you know, over half a billion people can go into poverty. We can reverse a lot of the goals uh, that we've uh, that we've progressed on in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, and so we need to act on this urgently. And debt swaps is a way to bring money uh, directly into areas that boost climate resilience and therefore create an immediate response uh, to the COVID nineteen pandemic and create uh, nature based solutions that uh, improve livelihoods. And we've been doing some things like this in Ethiopia, where we're, we're supporting, for example, tree replanting. Uh, so, and that creates jobs for people involved in that tree re replanting. And that tree replanting also uh, supports water catchment areas and protects water catchment areas. So I think there's there's something that can be done on the level of debt. And debt should be about development. It should be how, how you invest that money to improve people's outcomes, to improve their livelihoods and their prospects. So this feels, well, what I'm hearing you say, feels very much like a win-win. Complex though it may be. And I, we are about to hear from Yakuba around sort of elements of that complexity. But if we can get this right, if we can get the right groups around the table, there seems to be lots of potential. It's, it certainly is potentially win-win, I think, because there are a number of, uh, there are a number of uh, perhaps creditors who also recognize that, it, as Laura had said, it's better to have money that is secure than to have the risk of people not repaying. Yeah, yeah. So it, just by turning something on its, on its end a bit, we can look at this differently. Yukuba, I wanted to come to you for a question. I think um, that the example that Jean-Paul gave us earlier around the, the, the marine swaps in the Seychelles really demonstrated the importance of rooting this kind of activity at community level, at ground level, at local level in countries. And we know that to get the right engagement and the voices of the local level into decision making is critical. Uh, I know that you have worked extensively through the Devolved Climate Finance Alliance um, and, and you've looked specifically at issues around transparency and accountability and the way that finance is released by debt relief. 
Can you tell us a little bit how relevant this is and what we can learn from this to help with these debt swaps? Sure. In the context of Devolved Climate Fund, as you were saying, we have used the institutional architecture of Mali and Senegal to channel funds from the international level to the central level of the two countries. And from the central level to the region, circle, and commune to the rural population of Mali using the administrative framework of decentralization. Um, <clears throat> so if death relief occurs and funding for climate and biodiversity investment program becomes available, then it will be necessary to ensure that these funds are not confined to the central level of countries, but work in the sense that they reach the population that are most exposed to the perverse effect of climate change. So talking about transparency and accountability, the first thing citizens need to know is the nature and the extent of this, uh, the debt, because in many cases, this is kept secret. Second, they must be involved in the government's investment decision-making process to ensure that the investment meet their priorities, ensure social inclusion, reach the most vulnerable, etc. As part of the Decentralized Climate Fund or Devolved Climate Fund, we have set up a public fund to finance investment in goods, uh, in public goods identified by communities and implemented by local authorities, the municipalities. The aim was to fund community initiative after consultation with users on collective utility and relevance to adaptation to climate fund. It is a means of establishing an effective dialogue between producers involving all components of the community, especially women and young people, as part of climate change adaptation process. So in conclusion, I would say the decentralized management of climate fund by local authority and community requires reliable institutional and financial structures. If investment in depth are to ensure resilience to climate change, local knowledge and perspective must be integrated into the formal planning process of the local authorities. But I have to say that the integration of planning innovations into existing government planning system takes time mm. and has to be done at the right pace to ensure ownership of all actors and qualities. But, but Yakuba, that sounds promising, I think. So although it's complex and mm -hmm. although it takes time, yeah. It sounds like it is it's potentially possible and it's possible in a way that if we can learn how to do that well, we could take this to scale in other places. Would yes. you have a confidence about that? I'm absolutely confident. We, uh, IID uh, started this kind of project in uh, Kenya. That was years ago. It was in Ishiolo, and then we, we did it in Mali and Senegal, and we, from uh, year 1915 up to year 1919, we have developing this. And now, uh, myself, I'm working with the government of Mali, uh, the Ministry of Decentralization and uh, Public Administration. We are working uh, on a big proposal to extend it to the whole Mali. Uh, we started the pilot project that was in the uh, three circle, three three circle in uh, Mopti region, which is uh, in Mali, and uh, four department in uh, Senegal. So it is absolutely possible, and we have a moon, uh, we have means, we have tools, we we have a wide connection. So this sounds great to hear, uh, Jean Paul. Does some of the things that Yakuba was saying around, you know, how to connect at the different levels and how to ensure that all the different kind of community interests are represented. Does, did that match with your, with your experience? Yes, I think that's, uh, it's one of the biggest challenges because debt is, uh, by nature, it's taken on by governments, uh, at least in the context that we're talking, it's sovereign debt. Uh, and the populations are often not necessarily understanding 
the link between debt and uh, investment in public services or in actions that, uh, that improve resilience. Uh, so in the context of Seychelles, the formula was the creation of a trust fund. And anyone can apply to that trust fund. They, they just have to put forward a project which meets the guidelines, which are essentially going through projects which are contributing to climate resilience or improving uh, rehabilitation of, of nature or biodiversity. So it's very important that local people can feel connected in a way. And I think that was something that was very positive uh, in Seychelles. But I think going forward, one of the things that's going to be very important in terms of replication of these kind of operations will be to make it simple for governments because Seychelles had many years of negotiations to to conclude what was in, in, in the finalization a relatively small amount of debt. Uh, and the promise of this is such that we could actually do much bigger operations and do them relatively quickly. And the key is just to link them to the outcomes, is to be able to see where the money is going to be invested. Uh, in many cases, this can be done directly to, for example, community-based organizations where they, where they have a good track record. In other cases, it can be through trust funds, or in some cases, it can be through government budgets. I think all of the above are, are options if we can make debt swaps happen uh, at scale, and they can potentially be beneficial for everyone. So as we're coming towards the end of our discussion, um, Laura, do you, you know, is this the answer? Um, it sounds too good to be true. What are we hearing about how people are feeling around this idea? So, um, you know, there are people saying if we go back 10, 15 years, we had something called the Highly Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, HIPIC, and that forgave an awful lot of countries' debt. And here we are 15 years later back in this situation. What's to prevent us, you know, ending up in another 15 years in, in this situation? You know, we, we focus very much on the potential resources that could be used now for climate and biodiversity and recovery from COVID, but also changing the way the sort of the, the, the debts are structured, that's changed the way that lending happens, actually building in more of these sustainability criteria into loans going forward. Because um, as um, uh, Jean-Paul and Yacouba have both said, you know, resources are needed um, to support countries to recover from COVID and to address the biodiversity and climate crises. So there is also something that these swaps could do to show us what we might be able to do in the bigger picture and in the longer term. And it's not just potentially developing country debt, it's our own, you know, the, the, the money that we in the UK might need to recover from COVID or in other developed countries. Integrating, integrating sustainability criteria could be really important going forward. Thank you. So to close, I, I would like to ask each of you, uh, you know, this, this podcast is about making change happen. Uh, and, you know, we're very keen to try and pinpoint where the next change needs to take place. So, Yakuba, in, in, your, in your mind, where do you think the biggest change needs to happen next to make more of this opportunity? Thank you. For me... Um, a key first step is to make more accessible information available to parliament, local government, civil society, etc., on the possibility of uh, uh, these debt exchanges. As I was saying, uh, usually it is kept secret. Uh, the second thing is there is a need to ensure with recipient countries that there is an effective and transparent mechanism to channel fund to the grassroots to be invested in activities that build their, their resilience so that if this can be if these things can be done then we can start something i'm really interested to hear your point about this you know transparency and information so that everybody is really understanding that what, what the reality is and that that's not kept hidden uh, that's a really interesting point, I think. So, Jean-Paul, where do you think the next change needs to be if we're going to make the most of this debt swap opportunity? Well, I think this is directly linked to what we hope will be an outcome of the negotiations on the Conference of Parties uh, linked to the Paris Agreement. And of course, the next COP is in Glasgow. 
because we need to completely redefine the way we think about the response to climate change. We've tended to be quite reactive in relation to climate change. But we, we, the science shows us clearly how that's impacting countries. And in Africa, certainly the impact is, is dramatic. And we need to have mechanisms that allow countries to invest themselves to create uh, climate resilience. And we must remember what, what is debt actually for? Uh, debt is actually to build up your, your resilience, whether it be economic or uh, environmental, but to build up your capacity as a country to be able to deliver development to your, to your population. So that is about develop, delivering development. And what is, what is very particular about this moment in time, the majority of African countries do not have access to, to enough resources. Where they do have access to resources, those resources are very expensive at a very high rate of interest. And so they don't have the space to actually be able to invest money in areas that, for example, create climate resilience. At the same time, we have mechanisms to monitor if we were to do debt swaps. We have already the, the principle of nationally determined contributions where countries are voluntarily committed, for example, to invest in renewable energy. And in Africa, you have the double benefit of building resilience, but you're also, so resilience in terms of energy, for example, uh, and at the same time, uh, connecting people that have not been connected to electricity before and reducing carbon emissions, uh, both, both continental-wide in Africa and globally. So if we, if we can look at debt swaps in Africa, it'd be very easy to make a direct link between taking the proceeds of debt swaps and linking them directly to, for example, nationally determined contributions of African countries. And we all know that the Green Climate Fund has not been able to fund the level of ambition uh, that is needed in developing countries. And developing countries, in particular in Africa, don't have access to the finances unless we bring in innovations such as this. So I very much hope that the debt swaps uh, will be, as part of the results of, of, of the next COP, uh, one of the outcomes that countries can turn to and that we can all look at them and see them as transparent mechanisms that allow us to see where the money goes and build climate resilience in Africa and globally. Thank you for that. Laura, final point from you. Where should we see change? What we need, I think, to make this happen, and as Jean-Paul has just said, to actually de de deliver something that could be really fundamentally important for addressing the climate crisis, is to get the white people together to talk about this. So obviously, there's the, the debtor countries themselves, um, there's the, the creditors, there's the usual bilateral donors, there's the IMF and the World Bank. There's also China, who are a major creditor, and the private sector. And all of those actors all have quite different interests. So, you know, one of the things that we're proposing is that uh, a coalition under the auspices of the World Bank or the IMF come together to actually see how this could work in practice. And I think the key thing is particularly China and the private sector to engage with this. We, we, we're hearing, you know, various commentaries about this idea of debt swaps um, from, from different actors. Uh, we really need to hear those comments translated or see those comments translated into to concrete action and people coming together to discuss how this might actually be uh, turned into something. So I think a clear case for watch this space and a very exciting one too. So just remains for me to say thank you very much to our conversationalists today. So thank you, Yakuba Dem. Thank you. John Paul Adam. Thanks so much. And Laura Kelly. Thank you, Liz. Thank you all. So for our listeners, if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to find out more, uh, IID has produced a report called Tackling the Triple Crisis, Using Debt Swaps to Address Debt, Climate and Nature Loss Post-COVID-19. And that document has a lot of other references and reading material. So if you start there, it would take you on an interesting journey. The Make Change Happen page on the IIED website, www.iied.org, can give you more information about our guests today and their Twitter handles. And you're very welcome, please, to give us any feedback on the podcast's Twitter account, which is at IIED hyphen voices. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. And, and if you have, please do share with your networks and we look forward to being in touch soon. Thank you. 
You can listen to previous episodes of IIED's Make Change Happen podcast on our website at www.iied.org slash podcast. The podcast is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED's work, visit our website at www.iied.org.